We like to talk about the greatest of all time, the greatest athlete, the greatest actor, the greatest movie, the greatest president. Muhammad Ali, the boxer, is famous for proclaiming, I am the greatest. I remember watching on television when the baseball player Ricky Henderson uh, broke Lou Brock's all-time base-stealing record. And he picked the base up and held it over his head with Lou Brock there in the stands. And Ricky Henderson said, I am the greatest of all time. And I thought, boy, that's, that's boastful. Um, in a, there was a recent internet survey, and I don't know how many people were surveyed or wh what country this included. But they were asked, people were asked the question, who was the greatest person of all time? This is the top five. Number five was Martin Luther King Jr. Number four, Albert Einstein. Number three, Abraham Lincoln. Number two was Muhammad the prophet. And number one was Jesus Christ. So even people who do not profess to be believers in Christ or followers of him or practice, uh, practicers of, of his teachings recognize the greatness of Jesus. The passage that I want to read to you today emphasizes the greatness of Jesus. It's the verse I read to start the service today. It's 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And some say that this was a, a hymn, a very short hymn, but a hymn of praise to the Lord Jesus. And so I want you to, I want to read this, I want you to follow as I read this with you. And I pray today that uh, you will learn and worship with me today. This is a worship service. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 says, Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Short, simple. But this verse tells us why Jesus is the greatest of all time. It says there, without controversy. This means that it's not subject to debate. We could get into we could have disagreements about who's the greatest quarterback or the greatest pitcher or the greatest president and have discussions and debates. But he said there is no debate that Jesus is the greatest of all. Uh, with, uh, it's beyond dispute. He, he says this is a mystery. And in the Bible, this word mystery means something that was not revealed before but that is, has been revealed now. Uh, that word mystery is used 28 times in the New Testament. Uh, it, uh, there, it part, uh, usually it refers to truths and facts that were not revealed to, in the Old Testament that are revealed and explained in the New Testament. Um, and John MacArthur, the preacher and writer, explains the mystery. He says that the godliness mentioned here refers to the truths of salvation and righteousness in Christ, which produce holiness in believers. It's a very simple message. As so we follow the, the statements that are made in the scripture, what is it that makes Jesus so great? Well, it says, first of all, that Jesus was God manifest in flesh, that God, he was God revealed in the flesh. This speaks of his incarnation. That word incarnation is the word that just means made flesh. We talk about at Christmas time, we talk about the incarnation of Christ, how that God was made flesh and came and dwelt among us. This uh, story of the incarnation of Christ unfolds to us beginning in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah 7, 14 says, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, we know, means God with us. 
The fulfillment of that passage is explained in Luke chapter 1 when the angel Gabriel appeared to a young a woman, a virgin named Mary, and the angel said to her uh, that, uh, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And Mary said to her, How is this possible, seeing that I know not a man? I've not been with a man. How can you say that I'm going to conceive a baby? It's not possible. But the angel went on to say, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and therefore also that holy thing shall be called the Son of God. John 1 explains, In the beginning was the Word, and that's Jesus, and the word, was with, uh, the word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And without Him, uh, and, he, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We drop down later in John chapter 1 to verse 14. It says, And the Word, that is, Jesus was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 18, No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared Him. Later in John's gospel, in John 14, 9, Jesus' disciples said, you show us, you talk about your father all the time, you talk about God all the time, show us, show us your father. And Jesus said, if you have seen me, you have seen my father. This uh, explains to us that Jesus was God and he became man, that he was deity wrapped in flesh. And this is the greatness of Jesus that we say who's the greatest man or the greatest person of all time. Well, Jesus was a man, but he was not a mere man. He was God who became man. But when he became man, he did not stop being God. That's a mystery that's explained to us in the New Testament. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Then it says that Jesus was justified by the Spirit. The King James Version says he was justified in the Spirit, but that's, uh, that word uh, in, in there can be translated in or by, and I think here it means he was justified by the Spirit. One translation says he was vindicated by the Spirit. The Message Bible Version says he was proved right by the invisible Spirit. So many people doubted Jesus. They questioned his identity. They questioned his parentage. They questioned his character. They challenged his words. Every time he turned around, somebody challenged him and accused him and doubted him. Uh, during his lifetime, as he was growing up in his human body, even the children that Joseph and Mary had together, his half-brothers and sisters, they, they didn't believe who he was. And when he began his ministry, they encouraged him to stay home and forget such foolish ideas about becoming this traveling preacher and saying that he was God because they grew up with him. They thought he was their own full-blood brother and sister. And they, they continued that belief until later on when they, they, at least some of them, came to believe in the reality of who he was. Um, but the, uh, the Holy Spirit, though, justified him, and defended him on many occasions. The Holy Spirit inspired the writers of the Old Testament to predict the, the many things about the character of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and the miracles that he would perform, the things he would do, and the places he would go, and the things he would say. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist, the scripture describes how that the Holy Spirit came down from heaven in the form of a dove and stood over Jesus' head when the Father said from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit was there justifying, defending the person and the character of Jesus. 
When Jesus was considered a deceiver, an ally of the devil, a blasphemer, a false prophet, the Holy Spirit enabled, empowered Jesus to do the great miracles that he did. And these miracles testify to who he really was. When Jesus died, his body was imprisoned in the grave so that even his very followers, his disciples, thought that Jesus had deceived them. They had expected him to establish his kingdom and, and rule over it and make them, allow them to be co-rulers with him. And now he's dead. And they thought, why did he mislead us? How could we have been so wrong? But the, uh, the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. Romans 1, 4 says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Again, quoting John MacArthur, he says that this is an important declaration because he had died under condemnation. He died under the sentence of sin. He died as a criminal. And the verdict of the Jewish people and, the, and with the compliance by the Romans, uh, Roman soldiers was that he was worthy of death and that he should be put to death. The Jews considered him a heretic who threatened the kingdom of God. And the Romans considered him a challenger to the, uh, to the power of Rome. But in any case, he died under a cloud of guilt. But when Jesus rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he proved that the Jews were wrong and the Romans were wrong. Jesus had done nothing worthy of death. And though both groups condemned him, the Holy Spirit justified him by his resurrection. Jesus was justified by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Then it says that he was seen by angels. The Bible tells us that angels are minister, ministering spirits. They are our own class of creatures. Uh, I hate to break your bubble, but when you die and get to heaven, you're not going to get wings. Okay? Uh, I know some of you were counting on that. But we don't become, people don't become angels after we die. Angels are a special group of creatures. They don't reproduce. There are just as many, they don't die. There's just as many angels now as there were when God created them, although the scripture does tell us that a third of them rebelled against God and sided with Satan, and they're, they are demon spirits now. But the angels are ministering spirits. They minister to us in ways that we do not recognize. Some of y'all have seen the old picture with the little kids walking on the bridge. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's scary to think about what kids doing like that. But there's an angel there watching over them and protecting them. And that is probably a lot closer to reality than we imagine. Uh, the Bible talks about a guardian angels that protect us and and they are I don't see any of them sitting on any of your shoulders right now but they probably are 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 with us I don't know if always but at least at times and that probably explains how we have escaped uh, injury or death lots of times because the angels that are with us to protect us and and watch over us but these angels uh, have constantly watched over Jesus and have, have witnessed what he did. When the, first, when the angels were created, they surrounded his throne in heaven and worshipped him and waited on him hand and foot. When he took human form, they saw him in ways that they could not have imagined would ever happen, that God would leave the comforts of heaven and come to earth and to be mistreated the way that he was. I'm sure that uh, astounded them. They uh, rejoiced when they saw him born that helpless babe in the manger. And they gave announcement to the shepherds in the field that 
the Savior had been born. They watched him when he was 12 years old. And he went to the temple and had deep religious discussions with the teachers of the scriptures. And they marveled at that. They watched him grow up in the carpenter shop. Uh, the, the God of heaven learning the trade of a carpenter and working with his hands to make furniture, repair furniture and make furniture and fix things that were broken. And I'm sure as they watched, they watched in thinking, what a, why is God doing this? What a waste of time and ability and talent that he would stoop so low. They saw him when he walked 40 miles across the hot desert to go where John the Baptist was baptizing the Jordan River so that he could have, so that he could be identified by that, uh, the, the dove representing the Holy Spirit and by the voice of God from heaven. They saw that. And then right after that, they witnessed as he went in the desert and was tempted by Satan for 40 days. And the scripture says that after Jesus resisted those temptations and overcame them, that the angels ministered to him and encouraged him. They saw him as he preached and performed miracles for those three years here on earth. They watched, I'm sure, with confusion when people mistreated him and they mocked him and they falsely accused him. And I'm sure they thought they are doing that to the Son of God. And they didn't understand why. They saw him when he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and prayed. And the sweat came out in drops of blood. And then after that was over and Jesus had said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be done. They saw that. And then they came and ministered to him, the scripture says. They watched him through tear-stained eyes when he went to the old rugged cross and suffered and bled and died. And perhaps they thought, why is he doing that? Then they saw as Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus got permission to take his body down from the cross and, and uh, placed it in Joseph's tomb. And they rolled a stone in front of it. And then on Easter Sunday morning, they saw Jesus rise out of that grave. And the angels rolled the stone away from the mouth of that tomb so that when Jesus, when the women and Jesus' apostles came to the tomb that day and the Roman soldiers could see that his body wasn't there anymore, that he was gone, that he had risen from the grave. They watched as he ascended back to heaven and they explained to those who were there what had happened and why. And told them, don't stand there with your nose stuck up in the sky. He just gave you work to do. He's going to come back in a similar manner in which he has gone away. And today, the angels surround him in glory once again, watching to see what he needs or what he wants, and eager to worship him and give service to him. The angel, he was beheld, he was seen by the holy angels. They saw that. They didn't understand it. And the scripture tells us that the angels desire to look into the story of redemption. There was no redemption made, no salvation for the angels who fell. But there has been a way of salvation, of new life made through Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. It's been made for human beings, for us. The scripture continues he was, that Jesus was preached to the Gentiles. Some translations say he was preached to the nations. And that was surprising to the Jews. The Jews received from God the law and the prophets and the priesthood and the tabernacle and the temple. 
and many promises and prophecies about their Savior, their Messiah, who would come. But they thought He was to be theirs. He was coming for the Jews and nobody else, theirs exclusively. And they considered the Gentiles, and in, in biblical terms, you were a Jew or you were a Gentile. And I don't know that any of you are Jews by birth or by religion, so that means when we talk about Gentiles, we're talking about all of us. Um, but this scripture says that Jesus was preached to the Gentiles, to people, not just the Jewish nation, but to all nations. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul explained it this way. It says, God has made known to me the mystery, there's that word again, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto the, his holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and the same body partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Remember the Christmas story when Jesus was born and the angels went out in the fields to the shepherds and they gave them this great announcement. Fear not, they said to the shepherds, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, to all people, not just to the Jews, but to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first. Jesus came to the Jews first, but also to the Greek, that is to the Gentiles, to those non-Jewish people. When uh, later on we see that when uh, Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, met Jesus on the road to Damascus and was born again, was saved, became a believer in Christ, that God said to him, uh, he told uh, Ananias who was going to baptize him, he said, you go baptize Saul because I've chosen him to be the apostle, the missionary, the preacher to the Gentiles especially. The next chapter, and I believe it's Acts 10, we see a man, a, a Greek man named Cornelius, who's a leader of many soldiers. But he was a God-fearer. That is, he, he did not believe in the hundreds of gods that the Greeks and Romans believed in. But he knew there was one true God, but he didn't fully understand. And he was praying to the God that he knew a little bit about, asking for, for knowledge, for information, so he could be a true believer and follower of God. And at the same time that was going on, God spoke to, Corne uh, to Peter and said, I've got a fellow over here named Cornelius. And I want you to go see him and preach the gospel to him. And Peter said, but God, he's a Gentile. Why do I want to go to him? He's not a Jew. And God convinced him that the gospel message was not just for Jews, it was for Gentiles too. And Peter reluctantly but obediently went and found Cornelius and preached the gospel and Cornelius and his household believed and were saved. The gospel was preached. Jesus was preached to the Gentiles. Later, after Paul had gone and done his, uh, some of his missionary work and he was seeing Jews and Gentiles alike come to faith in Christ and some of the people objected. They said, oh no, these Gentiles, they, we don't want them. They can't be saved. They're just dogs. We, we don't even think they have souls. And if they do have souls, God doesn't care about them. But they called this great council to meet in Jerusalem to determine whether it was possible for Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to be saved or not and become part of the church or not. And if they could, whether they had to follow the Jewish law or not. And they came to the conclusion that the gospel was for all people. And that it wasn't just for the Jews, that Gentiles could be saved as well. And we have Jesus' commands 
what we call the Great Commission, where Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. He didn't say go teach the Jews, but they're included in that. Go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus told his disciples right before he went back to heaven, he said, and you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to all the parts, the uttermost parts of the world. Paul explained it in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, for after uh, that in the wisdom of God, uh, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. <coughs> yeah, some say, why do you want to get up early Sunday morning, clean up and dress up and go to church and spend your time in there when it's so pretty outside and listen to some fella get up there and tell you what to do and how to live? Well, because the Bible says that's what God has ordained, that God chose the, the foolishness of preaching to save them that are believe. He said, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but unto them who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ was preached to the Gentiles. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, for we preach not ourselves. Paul was not like some of these TV preachers who get up and talk about how smart they are and how rich they are and how you can, how you can be like me if you'll do what I say. No, Paul wasn't like that. He said, we don't preach ourselves. But we preach Christ Jesus the Lord and we are your servants for Jesus' sake. And so the gospel was for the Jews and is still for the Jews. But the gospel's also for people who are not Jews. And matter of fact, there's a lot more Christians, a lot more followers of Christ in the world today who are Gentiles than those who are Jews. Christ was preached to the Gentiles. Jesus was believed on in the world, he says. He was believed on in the world. John 1, 11, 12 says, Jesus came to his own, and his own received him not. That's one of the saddest verses in Scripture, isn't it? But the next verse, John 1, 12 says, But to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see this in action. Even as Jesus died on the cross, there's, he died between two thieves, one on the right, one on the left. And as the crucifixion began, both these thieves are laughing at Jesus and mocking him and making fun of him. But then one of them had a change of heart and a change of mind. And he looked at Jesus and he said to him, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And so you see it right there, two people, similar backgrounds, both of them about to die, and one of them rejects Jesus, and the other one receives him. Jesus was believed on in the world. We're told that after Jesus went back to heaven and that, that first celebration of Pentecost after that, that Peter got up and preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 people got saved and baptized that day, that day in that one service. Acts 4.4 4 tells us about a day a little while later when 5,000 men came to Christ in one place. That, that day. We've heard, I've heard, and you have too, our parents and grandparents talk about their day, a generation or two ago, when uh, little country churches would have revival meetings, week, two weeks, three weeks, maybe four weeks long, and 40, 50, 60 people 
would come to faith in Christ that week and they would line them all up and go to the creek and have a baptize and baptize 40 or 50 people all at once. We have uh, had a, a year, about 20 years ago here, where we had about 75 professions of faith in one year and baptized 50 that year. What a uh, uh, Jesus was believed on in the world. What a wonderful time that was. Things like that are still happening in the Philippines, in Africa. We're having tremendous results in Ghana, West Africa with our missionaries. Latin America, but not so much in America anymore. I did hear, I was talking to a pastor friend yesterday. He told me, local pastor, he said in their youth group, Wednesday night there were eight teenagers who professed faith in Christ that one youth group meeting. That's, that's wonderful. But I'm, I, I'm afraid what's happening in America is uh, generally we American Christians are not so eager to tell the story. And as a whole, Americans are not so eager to believe and respond. But it's still our command to preach Christ in the world so that the Holy Spirit can convict and Jesus can be believed on in the world. And then it says that Jesus was received up into glory. I've made reference a little bit to that already. The account is given in Acts chapter 1. It says, after Jesus had spoken these things, where he had told them, go into all the world and preach, uh, go in, uh, and preach in Jerusalem, uh, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they steadfastly looked toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by him in white apparel, that's angels. And they said to him, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up to you, uh, from you into heaven, so shall return in like manner. Jesus, after he had been here, and been mistreated and abused and died for our sins, went back to heaven. You see uh, news stories about, well, I read this week about a lady uh, who's a blind, she's blind now, 80-something years old, been in prison for 40-something, this is in Arkansas, been in prison for 40-something years for killing her husband and she said it was because he was abusing her and she did it in self-defense she got out of prison this week can you imagine and went went to live with some of her family members can you imagine the rejoicing that she felt i expect that's something like jesus felt when he ascended back to heaven after being here on earth for 33 years he was received up into heaven because he had finished what he came to earth to do. He went back to heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father to be worshipped and praised by the angels again. He went back to heaven to keep his promise to go and prepare a place for his people. He went back to heaven so that he could become our great high priest and pray for us and intercede for us all the time and help us when we need help. He went back to heaven so that he could keep his promise to return for us. One day he ascended and was received, was welcomed up into glory. There's a passage, this the scripture again said, this is without controversy. There's no doubt. This is a unanimous, uh, these things we have shared today, this is the unanimous belief of all born again Christians. You can't be a true Christian. You cannot be a true follower of Christ and yet, unless you believe these things. 1 John 2.23 says, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same has not the Father. But he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. And so I would tell you today 
these things we've shared with you today shows the greatness of Jesus. And it shows what He can do for you. But these things, this wonderful salvation He has bought and provided for and called preachers to preach to you and put on people's hearts to share with you, uh, it is of no effect, does no good to you unless you personally receive Him as your own personal Savior and you commit yourself to be His follower. But also He says that this is the mystery of godliness. That means that this is the motivation for us who are believers to live holy lives before Him and live godly lives in this ungodly world. 1 Peter 1.3 says that Jesus Christ, according to His divine power, has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So here's the challenge of the message today. If you have not trusted this great Lord and Savior we've talked about, trust Him today. He came to His own, and His own received Him not. But to as many as received Him, to them He gave the power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on His name. And the second challenge is, if you are a child of God, if you have received Him, let this life that He lived and these things that He did, let them challenge you to a commitment to Him to live a life of holiness and godliness because we owe Him that and so much more. Sean, come, let's sing together.